Good morning, and welcome to Sunday morning prayer worship for the fifth Sunday in the season of Epiphany. It's wonderful to be able to share and worship with you today as we begin our morning prayer worship on page 47 of the Book of Alternative Services, page 47. For we proclaim, Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. O come, let us worship. And we hear the words of the Jubilati. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us and we are his. And we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his faithfulness endures from age to age. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. O come, let us worship. Mark Hauser will read the first lesson this morning from the Old Testament, from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Our first reading is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 40, beginning at the 21st verse. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it been not told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught, and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth, when he blows upon them, and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see. Who created these? He who brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in power. Not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The word of the Lord. Our responsive psalm lesson this morning is Psalm 147, verses 1 to 13. And we'll read that psalm if you can find it on page 906, Psalm 147. Hallelujah. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant it is to honor him with praise. The Lord himself rebuilds Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He counts the number of the stars and calls them all by their names. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. There is no limit to his wisdom. The Lord lifts up the lowly but cast the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make music to our God upon the harp. He covers the heavens with clouds and prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass to grow upon the mountains and green plants to serve humankind. He provides food for flocks and herds and for the young ravens when they cry. He is not impressed by the might of a horse. He has no pleasure in the strength of a man. 
But the Lord has pleasure in those who fear him, in those who wait upon his gracious favor. Worship the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. God of the universe, Lord of life, give us grace to see you in all your works, in all creatures, all peoples, and in our hearts, that we may faithfully serve you and worthily praise your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Mark Hauser will read the epistle from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Our second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning at the 16th verse. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this of my own will, I have a reward, but if not of my own will, I am entrusted with the commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation I may make the gospel free of charge, so as not to make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might by all means save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessing. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew, and James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick and possessed with demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases, and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak, because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for them. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go out to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. And this is the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. And now, Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts here assembled be always and ever acceptable in your sight, for you alone are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, we continue again to move through this wonderful season of Epiphany, this season that speaks to us of light and manifestation of hope, of understanding who Jesus Christ is. Who is this one who has come into the world? And what is the mission and ministry entrusted by him to us that is, that is embodied in his very being in the world? And we have followed through various themes across the previous four seasons, four Sundays of Epiphany. And we come to this day and trying to think of a phrase or a word that could encapsulate all that the theme of this particular Sunday is about. And for me, that one word is restoration. Jesus is the one who comes to restore. God is the one who comes to restore who comes to restore the relationship 
between a humanity that has moved far from God and, and God who, who yearns and, and, and calls for them to draw near to him, between the people of God and the kingdom of God. God is the one who restores that relationship. Jesus is the one who restores that relationship for all humanity. And in all of the teaching and the proclamation that Jesus undertakes, it has that undergirding sense of restoration. We have that beautiful passage from the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 40, which is a wonderful almost Easter proclamation. It is a message that is told out to a, a nation that is languishing in exile, a nation for whom the hope of their future had been clean cut off, carried away from the land of hope and promise, the land where they understood the presence of God to have carried them, and the, where the presence of God would dwell. At the very center of the Holy of Holies in their capital city of Jerusalem in the temple, there dwelt the presence of the living God who called them forth from the land of Egypt, the sense of that living God who called into being everything that is. The universe is the Lord's, the fullness of everything that there is. He calls it all into being, and that presence was with them in a real and tangible way. And now they've been ripped and torn from that presence and carried off into the land of exile. But for people for whom their hope has been cut off and destroyed comes this message of hope and this theme of restoration. Remember how Isaiah 40 starts with the words, comfort, comfort, my people, speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is ended and her iniquity pardoned. It begins with a soothing message of comfort. And then it begins to ask a number of questions. And they're almost, in a sense, rhetorical, because what those questions are doing is an attempt to stir up in the heart and soul of the people languishing, languishing in exile, what they already knew, the presence of the living God who has promised to be present with them always. Remember the great words of the covenant, you will be my people and I will be your God. The, the presence of the living God would be with them from generation to generation. So the questions that are being asked, I love the way that it's put, have you not heard? Have you not seen? Do you not realize? You see, Isaiah is reaching down into the depths of memory and calling forth a knowledge of who the people actually are in relationship to God. And then goes on to describe the majesty of God who sits above the circle of the sky, that sense of, of the, the land and the sky and the universe and the presence of God that calls it all into being the one who is mighty and who is powerful. And then he goes on and he raises up and then asks the questions again. Do you not perceive it? Do you not know? Do you not see who this is? And then says, even the ones who are young will faint and grow weary. You know, there, there are those who will not know how to put one foot in front of another. But the one who never grows faint, who never grows weary, is present with us and continues to call us forward. The presence of the living God for the prophet Isaiah to the people in exile is the presence of one who restores and renews and calls them forth once more, restores them to the land of hope and promise. The one that calls them into the future, because again, if you're speaking about restoration, you're talking about making new, but, but reaching out into the future that lies before you to be restored to that land of promise. And so Isaiah is getting them ready for that journey that will take them back home from the land of bondage, from the land of exile, from the land of deprivation to the land that was promised to them, the restoration of the promise. So in the birth of Jesus Christ that we celebrated in the Christmas season, we see God coming into the world in human form. The word is made flesh and dwells among us. But who is this who is dwelling among us? And this beautiful season of Epiphany continues to lift in light and, and illumination, even as the days get longer and longer and longer around us. And now we see the personification of the promise, the promise and hope of restoration in Jesus. 
Then as, as they, they, we continue in Mark's gospel to move through, they leave the synagogue and they come to the house of Andrew and Simon. They're there with the disciples and their mother is, is, is ill. And there's again, that wonderful image of restoration where Jesus goes in and prays and Peter's mother is restored. Andrew's mother is restored. And she begins to serve. She begins to do the thing that is in her heart and soul when somebody comes under her roof to reach out and to care for and to serve. And it's that image of, of servanthood. For we indeed are being called to be servants of the living God. You see, the restoration that we're called to, to be restored and to make new again, calls us to that life of service. We are restored and we are called to be the ones who serve the world around us. And we see that in the presence of St. Paul as he's writing to the church in Corinth. You know, the word that is given, you see again, now that we see that message that came from Isaiah, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, and to talk about the living God who is the one that restores their hope and restores their promise and carries them back to the land from which they have been torn. We see it in the person of Jesus Christ, who is that word made flesh and dwelling among us, the one who restores. And we see that in the powerful imagery, because from that, Jesus moves forth from town to town to town carrying that message but it's not only a message of restoration but in the actions that he does that he heals that he casts out that which separates us from God he defeats even evil itself and that imagery of casting out the demons and having power over them that they cannot control the lives of the people of God he, the one who is the word made flesh restores and renews and calls us forth again and, and rescues us from that which would separate us from the love of God. It is the good news, the word uh, that, that came in the, in the Hebrew scriptures personified in Christ, but now calling us into the future. And that's where St. Paul is in the church in Corinth. He is now taking that word in the words of the gospel the good news of the commandments of Christ and the teachings of Christ. And now is carrying that out beyond, beyond where Jesus moved and where Jesus taught out into the world where Paul planted those churches and now teaching the Corinthian people about how to be the bearers of the good news. And I love how Paul describes it. You see, Paul goes to be not over, but among the people. And you see, I believe that the restored servants of God, when we've been restored to who we are as followers of Christ, strengthened by the Spirit to be servants in the world, whoever wants to be first among you, remember that, must be a servant. And whoever wants to be the greatest among you must serve like a slave. We are called to serve one another and care for the world in which we are in. So as Paul goes out, it's not to go out to be over the people, but to be among the people, to teach them and draw them together. And that's a beautiful imagery as he's called at center and heart of it all is proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. And he says to the Jews, I became as a Jew. To ones under the law, I became as one under the law. To those outside of the law, I became as one outside of the law. But all through that, you see, when Paul is speaking to the Corinthians, he knows where his rudder is. He knows what, can, what is able to steer him through those times that he can go among the people, but understands that good news that he's called to proclaim. That's the rudder that carries him forward. He is subject to the law of Christ. He is one who lives a greater law that is now written, not on tablets, not on paper. It's written in, in his heart and in his soul. He's called to proclaim that, to be among and with the people. I know the people that have been the greatest influences in my life have been the people that have not lorded it over others, that have not impressed by the power they can display and the might that they can display the ones who have been the powerful exemplars in my life have been the ones whose very lives are examples of perfect servanthood, who reached out in love for the world to care for one another, 
reached out with a message of hope, reached out in a, in a kind of a depth of care and compassion that is, is magnetic and draws you toward them. You want to hear more about what moves them forward in their lives. And that's who we are called to be as the restored people of God. We are to be the bearers of this good news that does not come to seek to dominate and to lord over, but seeks to come among the people and lovingly and caringly call us back into that restored relationship with God. And so as we come through these days, as we move through these days of epiphany and move ever towards the season of Lent and begin to take that inner journey in heart and soul, we continue to rise in the light and the manifestation of who this Jesus is for us. The one who is the word made flesh and dwelling among us. The one who comes alongside of us. The one who reaches out in a, with a gentle, loving caress to us and calls us to join with him in serving the world that God loved into being. So this day, feel that sense of restoration in your soul as you worship and praise the living God this day and then go forward to serve. Seek the ones out that you wish to serve. The ones and those are the ones that are, are, are across your path. The next person that you're going to meet, the person who is in need, the situation that you can address, come alongside it. and Be as St. Paul spoke to the Corinthian church, be in that way. Come around and be among and bear a message of hope to the world, for you will be blessed in the work and strengthened in the effort. And there may be times where you feel weak, where you feel faint, but draw strength from, as Isaiah says, this living God who calls us to mount up with wings as eagles, to run and not be weary, to walk and not faint. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us join together as we affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed on page 52, where we proclaim, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. Let us offer our prayers to the source of all love and all life, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. Merciful God, we pray for all who call themselves Christians, that we may become a royal priesthood, a holy nation, to the praise of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for Justin. Archbishop of Canterbury, for Linda, our primate, for Anne, our metropolitan, for all bishops and other ministers, that they may remain faithful to their calling and rightly proclaim the word of truth. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for Elizabeth, our queen, for the leaders of the nations and for all in authority, remembering especially Justin, our prime minister, Douglas, our premier, the mayors and reeves of the municipalities from which we come, that your people may lead quiet and peaceable lives. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for the cities and towns and villages where we live, for all who live there with us, for the poor and the rich, the elderly and the young, men and women, that you will show your goodwill to all. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for the victims of our society and those who minister to them, that you will be their help and their defense. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for those preparing for baptism, that they may be strengthened in the faith. 
Lord, hear our prayer. We give thanks for all the saints who have found favor in your sight from earliest times, prophets, apostles, martyrs, and those whose names are known to you alone. And we pray that we too may be counted among your faithful witnesses. Lord, hear our prayer. And the collect prayer for the fifth Sunday in the season of Epiphany. Merciful Lord, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught and commanded us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace. Remember the poor. Be kindly affectioned one towards another in brotherly and sisterly love. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. May God's richest blessings be with you through this week. It's so wonderful to have an opportunity to pause and to join together with you in prayer through this, through this forum. And I look forward to being with you again next week when we gather for Sunday morning prayer worship. Blessings. Mm -hmm.